Hello and welcome to Buy Into Blockchain, Why Understanding Blockchain is Crucial for Insurers. My name is Patrick Schmid and I am Assistant Vice President for uh, the Institutes. And I want to start off by apologizing for not being there in person today. Um, there's quite a storm in the Northeast and my flight was canceled out to Chicago. So I hope you are all enjoying the conference thus far. Um, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you about blockchain technology. So one of the first things I, I'd like to talk about is, you know, really how some of the vital pieces that formed blockchain, some of the areas that really blockchain technology stems from. In blockchain, the building blocks for blockchain stem from advancements uh, in computers, databases, and encryption, changes in monetary systems and systems of pay like e-commerce, and the development of information networks. Um, before we sp begin speaking about Bitcoin and blockchain and so on, it's good to understand these developments because and just kind of think about all the history involved in each of these areas and how quickly it expanded. Because blo blockchain is really a logical next step in uh, the development in each of these areas. If you really think about computers, they've developed very quickly from, you know, the onset really in around World War II to mainframes to PCs, very quick advancement, as is the case with databases. You know, there was once upon a time data was stored on punch cards, quickly moved to magnetic tape. We eventually gained relational capabilities. Encryption has been fascinating to see the developments in that space. Networks, certainly, you've seen the advancement in computer networks, uh, informational networks, social networks, and so on. And then even e-commerce. It's hard to think back to the fact that credit cards were only invented in the 60s, ATMs in the 80s, and even Amazon uh, was a bookstore at one time, um, and of course became kind of an e-commerce behemoth. Blockchain is related to all of the above. It fuses the network with the database using encryption, and allows for advancements in e-commerce and computing. They're all vital to the blockchain, which allows for further advances in each of these categories. But a logical question is where did this all start? Where did the blockchain itself start? So let's take ourselves back to 2008. The world is in the midst of a huge recession. The economy is falling into what would be the financial crisis. And only weeks after the Lehman Brothers collapses, a white paper is dropped on a cryptographic mailing list. And uh, the, the, the title of the paper is Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So what's Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a digital token that can be stored in a digital wallet and can be sent peer-to-peer -peer electronically. It eliminates the need for an intermediary, and that's really the key to Bitcoin and really the key to blockchain is it's eliminating this need for an intermediary. And in this case, the intermediary was, in some cases, you could argue banks, but really the Federal Reserve. Uh, the pro it had properties similar to gold in the sense that um, th there's a scarcity associated with uh, Bitcoin. There's only going to be 21 million ever, and there's over 16 million now. It's mined. Uh, every 10 minutes, a new block is confirmed. We'll talk more about the mining process in just a moment when we get into the blockchain. Um, but it is mined, not like gold mining, but similar in the sense that the only new Bitcoins that come about um, come about through mining. And in terms of the functions of money, it can, it can be used as money. It fulfills the medium of exchange. Clearly, you can exchange Bitcoin from person to person. Um, it provides a unit of account, has eight decimal places rather than two for the U.S. dollar. Um, and in terms of a store of value, I think this is where it's the most debatable. Some say it's too volatile to be a store of value. Others say, well, it's really been appreciating ever since its creation. Um, and there's there's reason for that. I mean, the, one of the first transactions ever associated with Bitcoin was for 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas. That values Bitcoin at well below a cent. And of course, now for one Bitcoin is valued at over $1,000. Let's just use $1,000 for simplicity. If Bitcoin was assumed to be $1,000 right now, that means that that pizza man has $10 million 
from that original transaction for two pizzas, one, one rich pizza man. So moving on to what the blockchain is, really the blockchain was what was under the hood of Bitcoin. So one of the first blockchains or the first blockchain was within Bitcoin itself. What is the blockchain? Well, it's basically this database or distributed database or shared ledger that maintains this constantly growing list of chronologically added records, which are called blocks. And in most blockchains, the new blocks and the data within, which could be transactions, if it's Bitcoin, smart contracts, if it's Ethereum, are confirmed and verified through a decentralized process that's called mining. And this verification process removes the need for intermediary validation and establishes trust without the use of a centralized authority. So really, you're removing the need for intermediaries and you're establishing trust via this new consensus mechanism. So if we look down at this chart here, we have a clearinghouse. Um, you can think of something like the traditional system behind banking. So if I wanted to send um, a message to... Um, or it's trans send a transaction to another party, I generally have to go through banks, including the Federal Reserve, and um, in order to make that transaction. But with the blockchain, that isn't necessary anymore. You can send it from peer to peer, and you don't actually have to go through that uh, consensus mechanism anymore. So basically, centralized databases holding a master copy in a single location that would be owned and changed by a single user is not necessary anymore with the advent of the blockchain. So with the blockchain, anything, adding anything to the ledger is considered to be permanent. There's immutability associated with it. It solves the double spending problem, which had plagued digital currencies before Bitcoin. And it establishes trust and eliminates middlemen, which increase security, tears down walls, meaning that you could enter into new markets speeds up transactions, meaning international transactions could be a lot quicker, and improves privacy. Considering all the above is doing, you can basically put everything on a blockchain and show every, the world every transaction, yet keep everyone who's making those transactions anonymous. So how is this actually working behind the scenes? Well, let's say John wants to send Gene a Bitcoin. So John goes into his digital wallet he types in Jane's address, he types in the amount of Bitcoin he wants to send to Jane, and he hits send. For John, it's as simple as that. He can go back to doing what he was doing before. What's happening behind the scenes? Well, that pending transaction is going to be broadcast to the entire network. So all those on the network, generally the miners, are going to know about this pending transaction if they would like to. Every 10 minutes, the miners are going to combine pending transactions like John and Jane's into a block. The miners are then going to race to solve some computational puzzle associated with that block. The miners reach a consensus and approve the block, meaning the transactions are valid. They're making sure that John had the money to send to Jane. The winning miner is then going to receive Bitcoin. So when we said before there's a mining process here where new Bitcoins are created, that's what we we're talking about. The winner of that computational puzzle receives the new Bitcoins. The block is then added to the blockchain, hence the term blockchain, and Jane receives Bitcoin from John when she logs into her digital wallet. That's pretty much the process behind the blockchain. It's a consensus mechanism. So there's been other blockchains that have formed. In fact, there's quite a few. If you look at coinmarketcap.com, I think there's over 700 cryptocurrencies, so there's a lot of blockchains. Ethereum is another one. This is a public blockchain-based distributed computing pl platform featuring smart contract functionality. It provides a decentralized virtual machine that can execute peer-to-peer -peer contracts using a cryptocurrency called Ether. So what exactly does this mean? Well, the key here is smart contracts, and this is really where insurance starts to get disrupted. So how does this work? So with a smart contract, you can agree to the contract up front, write the contract code into a... Uh, into a program using coding, place that code into the Ethereum blockchain, and if the event occurs, you can have an automated payout. So how would that work? Here's an example. Let's say that you have a crop, you want to insure your crop. Um, you write this insured um, crop. You, know, you, you say something along the lines of, um, let's say you want to say, you don't want the temperature to go um, stay above 
105 degrees for over two weeks. If it's over, if it goes above 105 degrees um, solidly for two weeks consistently, then there would be a payout associated with this. You agree to that contract up front. You write that code, uh, write that contract into a code, and you place that code into the Ethereum blockchain. You'd need an oracle, so something like weather.com or something of that nature, to check whether the temperature went above that. And if it did go above 105 degrees for two weeks straight, then there would be an automated payout associated with that. So you can see how this can be very disruptive um, if you can think about these smart contracts being layered throughout business processes. And this is made businesses even more interested in investing in this and looking into blockchain technology. So um, the public blockchains like Bitcoin or Ethereum, they are platforms where anyone on the platform can read or write to the platform and they're considered to be fully decentralized. A private blockchain, on the other hand, allows only the owner to have the rights um, on any changes that have to be done. Um, a hybrid is what we're increasingly seeing. These are kind of consortium blockchains. So you may have seen something like this with R3, the banking uh, consortium, where there's about 70, 80 banks that have gotten together to form a consortium and they have their own blockchain amongst the consortium. Um, no other parties can see that, unlike a public blockchain. Um, so there's been more and more consortium blockchains being developed. There's also been some recent developments where um, Enterprise Ethereum, for example, has been using, is planning to use JP Morgan, what, what JP Morgan's quorum did, which was try to create a permission blockchain on the public Ethereum blockchain. The thought being kind of like local area networks were the first testing ground for eventually what would be the internet to move to the public sphere. So um, JP Morgan's quorum was kind of novel in that. And Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which the institutes are a member of, is trying to extend that by building standards into how businesses can increasingly use this um, via permission chains on the Ethereum public blockchain, which will provide more interoperability in the future. So there's a lot of business testing going on in this space right now, and you can see some non-insurance use cases under development here. Um, for example, in auto sales, um, Visa and DocuSign are trying to build a proof of concept for car leasing, simply click sign and drive. Um, I mentioned before R3 and banking, they have Corda, which is trying to syn synchronize financial agreements amongst members. Um, in energy, Ethereum has been used for the first paid energy trade using blockchain technology. Um, the healthcare, IBM and the FDA have gotten together to inspect um, use cases in the health space. Disney is looking into building its own blockchain called Dragon Chain. Walmart is using this uh, technology to track and trace pork in China and produce in the United States. So a lot of industry use cases outside of insurance. But how about insurance? Well, blockchain can help with insurance pain points. I think everyone um, who, who I'm sure is there knows about there's varied insur pain points on the insurer side and, and from the consumer perspective. We look at the consumer perspective the customer experience within insurance is not ideal. Um, in fact, a digital consultant engine ranked insurance as the worst for customer experience. Just explaining that there's often complex questionnaires, maintaining of physical receipts can be necessary, um, and, and there's not really a seamless personalized solution. Blockchain can help with that. In terms of high premiums, it's, uh, there's often scrutiny regarding affordability by consumer groups. Uh, blockchain may be able to help with that as well if it can cut down on uh, insurer costs. Um, slow entry into emerging markets. This may become more feasible if insurer costs are limited or lower, I should say. And there's been weak product innovation. But with widespread adoption of new technology, um, including blockchain, it might be more possible for peer-to-peer -peer services, sharing economy, Internet of Things, driverless cars, all the above can kind of lead to new forms of product innovation and blockchain can help with ensuring all of the above. On the insurer side, there's high administrative costs throughout the uh, insurance experience. Costly intermediaries are scattered throughout as are fragmented data sources. 
The process um, on the claim side is very manual. According to a Capgemini report, auto insurers could save $21 billion annually by instituting smart contracts alone. Um, there, it's very fraud prone. Um, so fraud's a problem, and anything that could control it would be welcome, including blockchain technology, which could weed out fraud. And it's, it's, there's a stringent um, regulation involved in the industry. Throughout all the above, there's some common themes. There's a theme of automation being able to help, uh, improve third-party integration, more extensive market reach, and greater efficiency. Blockchain can help enable and solve some of these pain points associated with the insurance industry. The question really is how? And there's various ways in which the blockchain could help in each area of the insurance value chain. We'll talk about a couple here. So products, pricing, and distribution. Parametric insurance, for example. Blockchain-enabled smart contracts can be used to make payments upon the occurrence of a triggering event. That's like the crop insurance example we were giving earlier. Insurance could also be included in transactional purchases, which probably would fall under the products pricing and distribution um, heading as well. In the underwriting and risk management area, maybe provenance, blockchain could help by tracking origin of items and ownership. Um, data sharing and risk registries could pop up via blockchain. Uh, there are a multitude of ways in which a consortium could, chain could allow insurers to share data. In fact, peer-to-peer -peer insurance probably becomes more practical under the underwriting and risk management section here um, as you move towards a blockchain um, approach. In terms of policyholder acquisition and servicing, policyholder acquisition, um, blockchain could help with policyholder acquisition just by ensuring that customer data and customer information that they provide is indeed their data and information. In terms of placement, um, Policyholder, similar to the policyholder acquisition example, a blockchain could provide access to keys to contract documentation, and these keys, keys could be shared between uh, necessary parties, which could be separate. And therefore, documentation could be updated over the life of the policy. In terms of claims management, as we mentioned before, it could weed out fraud via a fraud register. It could automate claims, uh, the entire claims process. The World Economic Forum has a great example on how smart contracts could automate the entire insurance claim process. Uh, in finance payments and accounting, I'll give you one example. Subrogation often includes exchange of monies amongst insurers. Therefore, any form of a shared ledger, particularly a consortia ledger amongst companies, could be really useful in netting payments, eliminating manual process, processes, and speeding the whole thing up. Um, in terms of regulatory co and compliance, uh, Real-time regulatory monitoring would become increasingly possible with the advent of blockchain. Um, you could even have educational licensing and catalogs associated with that sort of thing develop. Proof of insurance might even become possible. So a lot of areas across the entire insurance value chain, and this is just scratching the surface, in which blockchain technology could be inspected. I want to end there and thank you for your time today. I'm really excited about this technology. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email address is here, as is my Twitter handle. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Again, feel free to reach out with any questions. Thanks again.